Well, I want to say welcome. Uh, welcome back to Cross Community Church. We're glad that you are, are here today. Y'all are now early service people. Uh, I, that's just a little more credit, right? That's a little something to pat yourself on the back about. You get to sleep in and still brag that you're not like those late service people. So uh, again, I just want to welcome you. We are returning, and this has been quite a long hiatus, uh, but we're returning to our walk through the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, the good thing, about the scriptures is that no matter what season of life we're in, I don't know how it's been for you over the past several months. Uh, maybe it's just been smooth sailing and easy. And maybe for you, you feel like the world's burning down around you and you're just like, hey, this has been really hard. Uh, no matter where you are in your life, um, the scriptures have something to say to you. Uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount is the, the inaugural sermon that Jesus preached. He comes in, in, in particular, he's speaking to Jewish people. Uh, but through the word of God, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today as well. Now, here was the attitude of Jesus. No matter where he went, what city he went into, uh, we, we, we heard this a little bit last week, but he went to all the cities and villages and everywhere he went, as he saw the people, and, and listen, he wasn't looking at their externals. He wasn't looking at, hey, you know, is your life pretty smooth right now? Or is this a rocky patch for you? He wasn't looking at the externals. He was looking into their hearts. And, and the scriptures tell us that Jesus, as he traveled throughout the cities and villages, he looked at the people and he had compassion on them. Because they were distressed and dispirited. Your translation might say harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. You see, Jesus looked past the exterior of their lives, the, the front they might have presented, and he saw into their hearts, and he saw the brokenness and the pain and the turmoil that existed there in the lives of the people. And it was into a world filled with that pain, that turmoil, that brokenness that Jesus, he steps in and he begins to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount of how we were made to live, of what the kingdom of God would look like if we, if we all just started living in accordance with God's will. Here's what citizens of heaven should live like in this broken world that we live in. Rather than living as sheep without a shepherd, our good shepherd Jesus came and he said, hey, come and follow me. I'm the way and the truth and life. Follow me. You're going to find an abundant life that you'll never find in anywhere else in all of creation. And so it's in that that Jesus is teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount how to live. Now, there is a temptation for us. Jesus said about his church, about his people in the Sermon on the Mount, if you don't remember where we've been, uh, Jesus said this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That as believers, as followers of Jesus, we should be distinct in the world. Like there ought to be something good about us. Uh, I, I gave the illustration before about light and its benefits. Like salt and light, they both bring improvements or they both bring benefits by virtue of their presence. So when I was a kid laying in bed staring into that closet and seeing those monsters who were out to get me that were clearly there, I'd, re I'd studied for quite some time. I knew there was something in the closet coming to get me. And I would make the trip and flip on the light and realize the monsters weren't actually there. It was just in my mind. The things that felt threatening were suddenly pushed away by the light. And for us, Jesus says, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're supposed to bring goodness into the darkness. The world should be enriched and preserved by virtue of our presence. So again, Jesus is like, hey, um, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Now, I want to teach you what that looks like. Like And that's where he's been teaching us. If you remember uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, he was speaking to a people who, like us, had a tendency to shrink back from being salt and light. And instead, they had a tendency to, to, to really let their salt become unsalty. And their light, they, they, they were tempted to hide it a little bit. And so he was speaking to a people who had the law of God on their lips. They could quote the verses. They knew the Old Testament. They, I mean, they knew the prophets. They had the law on, the lips, but, on their lips, but they didn't have the light of God in their hearts. And so here's what he says to them. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. He says, You have heard that the ancients were told. You know the law, right? You have heard the ancients were told. You shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. So to a group of people who knew the law very well, they would have expressed it, they could have quoted it. When he said, you have heard the ancients were told, they're like, oh yeah, I got this one. I don't know what he's about to say, but I know the Old Testament law. To a group of people who had the law on their lips, 
he begins to reveal that they may not have light in their hearts. So he says, you've heard it said, the anxious were told, you shall not commit murder. And if you do, you shall be liable to the court. Jesus presses in. He reveals to us that discipleship, the abundant life of Jesus Christ, of following him, it's not found in merely managing external behaviors. I mean, very few of us think that's a bar for right behavior, right? If you could just brag on one day and be like, you know what, I hated somebody, I wanted to kill somebody, I, got, I was so furious, I couldn't stand them, I, I don't like people, I, but just so you know, I stopped short of killing them. Very few of us pat ourselves on the back about that. And yet for us as believers, we often have this tendency to ignore what's really going on in our hearts. To rather than look what's happening beneath the surface, we look at the external behaviors. Well, I didn't kill them. I didn't murder anybody today. And so Jesus, hey, you've heard it said. You know about the externals. You know the law, right? You're not supposed to commit murder. And if you do, you're guilty before the courts. But he presses in. He's teaching us that the kingdom of God is not found in merely managing external behaviors, but it's, it, it's found in having a transformed heart. So look what he says in verse 22. He says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother... Wait. Angry? Everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You fool is guilty before the courts. Wait. Jesus, here, the law says don't murder, and I didn't murder, right? I'm, I'm justified. But again, he's not interested in teaching us how to conform externally to the law. Jesus wants to transform our hearts. So he pushes further. He would say, have any of you been angry with your brother? Have any of you been watching the news coverage lately and heard one of the people talking on television and thought, you fool? Have any of you maybe been watching the YouTube video or the news clip and you saw the people burning things down and rioting, maybe even looting, and thought, those good for nothings? Jesus says, you're guilty before the court. You're missing out on the fullness and the abundance that's available to you in Christ Jesus. There's something broken in your heart that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be set free. You see, a heart that is full of murder or anger or bitterness or unforgiveness, regarding your brother as good for nothing, is not a heart that's free. It's not a heart that belongs to God. You may have grown up in church you may be able to quote the verses. You may have the law on your lips. And Jesus would say, but do you have the light of God in your hearts? Are you the salt and light of the world? Or has this thing happened to you where the salt has lost its saltiness? Where the light has been hidden? And rather than standing out in the world as something that's going to enhance and preserve our culture, you've become like the culture. The light has been hidden. The salt is losing its saltiness. So maybe for us as believers today, a couple of thousand years after Jesus, in the midst of what is a difficult season for many of us, the, the question that we have to ask is, am I being salt and light or am I being conformed to the culture? Am I, am I patting myself on the back that I haven't killed anyone today or have I really allowed the light of the gospel to look inside my heart? Is there bitterness and anger and unforgiveness? Is there hatred? Am I regarding my brother as a fool or good for nothing. As the church of Jesus Christ, we've been called to be the light. The light of the world. That when people see us, they see something different in us. They see hope. They see Jesus Christ represented through his body here on earth, through the church. That they would regard the church as something unique and distinct from everything else they see. And yet for us, just like it was for the Pharisees or the Jews of Jesus' day, it's really easy to look at our outward behavior and think, no, 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 we're, we're doing pretty good. I'm not rioting or looting. I haven't killed anybody today. Question, has your heart been set free from bitterness, anger, hatred, regarding your brother as a fool or a good for nothing? See, Jesus, he's fighting for their hearts here. He's going to call them to something greater, to freedom in him. So we can be salt and light. Or we can shrink back. We can blend in. We can follow the patterns of culture. 
draw up our battle lines, form into our camps, speak terribly about the other side, uh, associate with a bunch of people who feel and believe like we do, and and push everyone else to, to being the other or something else. We are right and they are wrong. But in the kingdom of God, we're not supposed to be divided. As Jesus went through the cities and villages, rather than having a heart filled with anger and frustration and hate, what he felt was compassion. Is that your heart? Because that's the kingdom. That's the life of a disciple. That's what Jesus would want us to live in. That's the the life that he's called us to, the life which is above any other life that we could possibly live. The Pharisees, they had the law on their lips. They had no light in their heart. So they could go about day after day putting men to death for murder while having murderous thoughts in their own hearts, while harboring bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. Externally, they were following the law, but internally, they were missing the light of the gospel, the hope of God in their hearts. Jesus continues on. We're going to skip through a few verses. That was kind of a a recap of where we've been. But in verse 33 of Matthew chapter 5, he's going to hit another topic. And it's one that seems kind of foreign to us. You may not understand uh, what's going on at first. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, he hits on another one. You have heard it said. you got the law on your lips. You probably know this. You've read the Ten Commandments. You have heard it said, the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows. Now, Jesus is actually paraphrasing, which means this would have been completely common knowledge among any Jew back in the day. They all would have understood what was being talked about here. You've heard the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Now, this is Leviticus 19, obviously in the Ten Commandments. We don't bear false witness. Leviticus 19, you shall not swear falsely by my name. And and here's what's going on. Now, we don't have this in our culture, so it's going to feel a little bit foreign to you. Um, But they were making vows to one another. And there was an intricate system of determining how binding a vow was. Now, most of you, you made vows when you got married and probably have never done that otherwise. If you're a soldier, you might have done something like this and enlisting into the military or been sworn into office. But most of us, we don't spend a lot of time making vows. But for the Jews, again, there's this intricate system. Of, of knowing how binding your vow was. And so uh, you could determine whether or not you were bound or how bound you might have been. This should feel great to you because it was. Um, you could determine how bound you were to keep your word by how closely the thing you swore by was related to God's name. That's, that's how it works. So here, here's an example. Um, Look in verse 34. Jesus says, I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for that's God's throne, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And don't make an oath by your head, because you can't turn a hair black or white. Uh, If you want a further treatment of this, um, if you fast forward Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22, um, here's how uh, another example of how it worked. If you swore by the temple of God, you weren't bound to keep your oath. But if you swore by the gold of the temple, had to do it, right? Uh, If you swore by the altar in the temple, um, but didn't swear by the gift on the altar, you were free. You could break your vows. And so what had happened were the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish people, they had basically developed an elaborate system of deception. Oaths, which were meant to be affirmations of what was true, were instead cleverly, clever disguises for deceiving your brother. So the Pharisees, on the outward, had this system. I swear by the temple of God that I'll do what I said to you. I swear by the altar of the temple that I will keep my word, I will do what I'm supposed to. And yet, really, they uttered something with their lips that they had no intention of keeping in their hearts. Now, again, it seems a little bit strange to you, um, but they were abusing the Word of God. They had the Word on their lips. They could have quoted Leviticus. They could have quoted the Ten Commandments. Where I'm being really careful. I'm not swearing by the name of God like the Scripture says. I'm not taking the Lord's name in vain. I only swore by the temple, not by the gold of the temple. And so here's what Jesus says to them. Again, but I say to you, make no oath at all, 
either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you can't make one hair black or white, but instead let your yes, yes, and your no be no. Anything beyond this is evil. Now, there have been a lot of debates over the years as to um, believers making oaths. Um, someone who is a Christian who is saying, okay, Jesus, you're teaching us here how to live as disciples of a new kingdom, how to be salt and light in the world. Does this mean I can make no oath? I mean, didn't Jesus just say, make no oath at all? And so the Quakers, for example, um, that's how they took this. And they would not make an oath to anyone for any reason. They wouldn't testify in court, they wouldn't say the Pledge of Allegiance, and they would not sign a legally binding document. And yet, what Jesus has not done here is, is, is uh, prohibited us from making an affirmation of what is true. He just said, let your yes be a yes, and your no be a no. Don't utter something with your lips that you don't intend to fulfill uh, in your heart. As a matter of fact, if you kind of look throughout scriptures, Acts chapter 18, verse 18, we have Paul making a vow. Uh, Acts 18, 18. In Centuria, Paul had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Now, you can't keep a vow you didn't first make. So you have Paul making a vow. In Matthew 26, verse 63, this is the, the high priest says to Jesus. He's got him on trial, right? He says, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this word adjure in the Greek, it literally means to extract an oath or to force someone to make an oath. So he puts Jesus under oath and says, tell us whether you are the Son of God. And if you remember, Jesus replied in the affirmative, yes, it is as you say. So Jesus, in a sense, made an oath. And then Hebrews 6, 13, we have God making an oath. It says, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And so... Jesus is leading you to life. And you're probably thinking, I don't make oaths. I don't, you know, since we you know, gave up pinky promises, I haven't done much of that in my life. What does this even mean? And yet, uh, I think it is important to ask, like, what, what is Jesus actually speaking to us? What is he telling us to do here uh, in the Sermon on the Mount? What does it look like for believers to not make oaths or to let our yes be a yes and our no be a no? As salt and light in the world, and let's be honest, a world that is pretty bent on greed, on selfish ambition, on desires where people are fighting and clawing and always trying to get ahead, making sure we come out ahead in the deal or, or we get the promotion in a world that is obsessed with our own progress, with elevating ourselves. Salt and light in this world means that no matter what, our word is true. We speak the truth, and we do what we say we're going to do. We don't talk ill of other people for our own gain. We don't elevate ourselves beyond what is actually true about us. We let our yes be yes and our no be no. In a world where no one is dependable, Jesus is saying, if you say you're going to do it, you do it. You know, as we, we got options, right? Anyone know what the fear of missing out is? FOMO, right? Y'all heard of this, right? So here's what happens. We got so many options today. We're affluent, and, and there's a lot of fun things to be had. And so we're not at the place where uh, maybe when I was a kid, I didn't get like multiple offers to go do fun things on a weekend. It was like stay home with mom and dad and do chores, or you could come up to the church and scrub some. Or, you know, there just weren't a lot of options. And so um, even anything that would get us out of the house was a win. But that's not where we are today, right? we got options. we got all sorts of things to do. And has this ever happened to you? Where you made a commitment to somebody. Yes, I will come help you move again tomorrow, right? I'll bring my truck. We'll sweat. It'll be a rough day. I'll do it. But then someone calls you, and there's this really great opportunity to go do something you really, really wanted to do. And you've got to make a decision. Do I let my yes be a yes? Miss out on that thing I really wanted to do, and instead go sweat and move him again. And he's just going to move again in another six months, right? Jesus would say to us, in a world who's obsessed with having fun and doing their own thing and making sure we don't miss out, Jesus would say, let your yes be a yes, and your no be a no. And even more so, has anyone here learned to be kind of noncommittal? 
You know what I'm talking about? Where people are like, hey, you want to come over and hang out? And you're like, well, yeah, um, yeah, maybe I'll think about that. And you're like, anything you can do to not obligate yourself to have to show up at their house. Jesus would simply say to us, let your yes be a yes and your no be no. Salt and light in this world literally just simply means doing what you say you're going to do. Being willing to put yourself on the line and say, yes, I will be there. Like, I will do the thing. People can depend upon me. The world should look at the church of Jesus Christ and think, man, I wish I could do more business with people like that. We should be the first people they would want to call. When it's time to, to go to work, we should get there early and say, we should be people of integrity who do exactly what we say we're going to do. And they know when we say no, it's a no. And when we say yes, it's a yes. So... The sermon today, um, you guys, we can break the huddle here in just a minute. You can go out and just let your yes be yes and your no be no, and, and that, that could be enough. Honestly, it's challenging for us as a church to do what we say we're going to do, to not be flaky people, to not deceive others for our own gain. But I think there's something deeper at work in this text. There's something else going on here that I think we need to, to look into, because doesn't this seem crazy that religious people would have an intricate system of Making oaths and, you know, you know if you're bound or you're not bound. And really, you don't know if you're bound or you're not bound. But you can basically wiggle your way out of any situation. It seems crazy, doesn't it? This is what happens when we have the law of God on our lips, but no light of God in our hearts. This is what happens when our hearts aren't being transformed. We find ways to work our, ourselves or work our way around the clear teachings of the Word of God? Has anyone ever encountered a text that you read in Scripture and it's Jesus teaching and you're like, I don't want to do that. And so we kind of find ways to justify not being obedient. We find ways to let ourselves continue to hate our brother. We find ways to excuse the little lies. We justify our greed or our selfishness. My wife has a lamp in our living room. Now, I'm a very practical guy, right? So furniture should be, like, of use. And if it's not of use, we shouldn't have it. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's like a tool, right? So my wife has a lamp in our, our living room. And I have gone through this lamp a few different times because it makes me crazy. Uh, all the pieces are there. We've got a pretty little lampshade stand. All the things. I've changed the bulb twice and uh, check the plug-in, and the thing will not work. I, I have checked the outlet, I mean the, the socket that you screw the bulb into. I have gone through this thing, and no matter what I do, I cannot make the lamp work. Like, it's incredibly frustrating to me, and so there's this piece of furniture. It doesn't provide any light. It just sits there, and it drives me crazy. And, and it really, if I knew, okay, bulb's broken, some, you know, it would be better because at least I would know what was wrong. The only thing I can conclude is that somewhere inside of that lamp, in the middle of one of the pieces, there's something broken. I mean, the one job of a lamp is to provide light, right? Like, and if the lamp is plugged in and got all the parts there and it's got a bulb that works, but it's not providing light, it's, it's a symbol, I mean, that should tell us, a signal, that something inside is broken. And the same is true for us as a church. Jesus says to us, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. And when that's not what's coming out of us, when the world isn't looking at us and saying, look at the church, like look at how they're, they're living, like they're bringing light into the darkness, they're seasoning, they're preserving, they're enhancing the, the culture, like I want to live like that. When that's not happening in us, it could be a sign that something is broken, that it could be true of us that we have God's laws on our lips, but we don't have his light in our hearts. So we're not living it. Well, maybe we're not connected to God rightly. We're not getting up in the morning and spending time in the Word. Um, as Jesus would say, He's the vine and we're the branch. He who abides in me and I in Him, that's the one that bears much fruit. Can I just take a minute and ask you to examine your hearts this morning? As you sit here today, kind of get past the externals. Haven't killed anybody this week and I mean, haven't openly defrauded anyone as far as I know. Um, if you were to look into your heart, is there unforgiveness? Is there anger? Bitterness? 
You thought of anybody, you fool, and you good for nothing? If you're honest, is your heart set on you and yourself and your own good? Maybe some greed going on beneath the surface? Jesus was using texts that were very common. Everyone would have known. But he was doing so to illuminate what was really going on in their hearts. He was going to go on in the text. We'll, we'll get there in a few weeks. And he was going to say, in the end, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you might say, well, that's impossible. And Jesus would say, that's the point. He was standing in front of a group of men and women who were doing their dead level best to follow the law. And they did so with their lips, but their hearts were still far from God. And in the hope and telling them, hey, be perfect as, as your Father in heaven is perfect, Jesus was helping them realize their desperate need for a Savior. Because d Jesus didn't go to the cross. He didn't like come to earth and live his life and go to the cross that we might stop short of murdering someone one day. I mean, obviously, he doesn't want us killing each other. And he didn't go to the cross that we might stop short of committing adultery with hearts still filled with lust. He didn't go to the cross so that we would avoid this weird system of making oaths, but instead that we would have integrity in our hearts and our, our word would have meaning. Jesus went to the cross. He died there. He suffered and he bled to set our hearts free that no longer would be, be, be controlled by our uh, unforgiveness or bitterness or malice or lust or deceit or greed, that we could be free in him to walk and live this abundant life as his disciples. And so for us today, the question that I would want to ask you today is, is your heart free? Or is that sin still there? Because what Jesus was doing was he was shining a little light in their hearts. Say, hey, hey, this needs to be healed. There's something in this little lamp that's supposed to produce light, that there's something broken, that it's not working like it's supposed to. So in our response time today, there are two options for us. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've never trusted him, maybe you've tried really hard to be good in your life, but it just hasn't worked out for you. Um, if that is you, then today I want to invite you to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus was the Son of God who came in flesh and lived a perfect, sinless life on this earth. He taught us how to live. And then he went to the cross for us to make an atoning sacrifice for our sins. For those of us who have placed our faith and trust in him, the scriptures say that Jesus, God took our sin, he placed our sin on Jesus, and he credited the righteousness of Jesus to us. So it's not as if we haven't sinned. It's merely that our sins have been atoned for. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, I want to invite you to trust him, to acknowledge your sin before God. Be like, you know what? I do okay on the exterior, but my heart is not where it should be. I want to invite you to trust Jesus today. We're going to have a time of response and invitation. If you want to know more about what that's like, I'll be up here. We have people that would love to visit with you and share with you about how to begin walking as one of his disciples. But for those of us who've been in church for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we need to let the light of the gospel shine into our hearts and not merely settle for what's on the exterior but to look inside of ourselves, to acknowledge the anger and the bitterness and the unforgiveness, maybe the greed, the selfishness that might exist there. Confession, in the Greek, it's homologeo. It just means to call it what it is, to say the same thing that God says about your sin, to come to God once again and say, hey, there's this sin here. And God, I want to turn away from that. I want to repent of it. And I want to begin walking in your abundance. I want to be salt. And I want to be light, but I can't do it apart from you. So today, the invitation for you in this time of response, we're going to have the band come, they're going to sing, is just to do business with God, to offer your heart to Him in obedience. If you need to be saved, I'll be here. I'd love to share with you. If you need to repent, I would love to pray with you. The person next to you in your seat or your row would love to pray with you. But you respond in obedience to God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word for how, Lord, you're not a God who it's a letter of a law, and if we can't fulfill it, then we're, we're hopeless. But God, you're a God who died for us that we might find life and that our hearts might be fit, set free 
from sin and brokenness and pain, God, that we might find healing and find abundant life in you. And so, Lord, in this church, I pray that your name would be lifted up. I pray that we would be salt and we would be light. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that today would be the, sal- the, the day of salvation for them. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.